All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, how are you doing today? I have Mr. Rich Cooper, not my brother, uh, just the same last name here with us today. How are you, my friend? I'm fantastic, Rich. It's good to it's see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. You are, uh, yeah. Out there in Canada, I'm I'm over in Dubai right now. Slightly different uh, um, sceneries, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Very different, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, a little bit different. But today we're, we're here to talk about something a little bit different from what we normally talk about. Normally we're talking about, we talk about whamming and, uh, and relationships and, and things like that. And today we're going back, we're going back in time to your, your area of expertise. What actually, what actually got you to the place you are today and that's entrepreneurship, Rich. Yeah. And I, you know, I should congratulate you because I haven't, I haven't watched, um, and you know, seen what's been going on with your channel that much lately. And you've, you've grown it quite a bit. I mean, when we first talked, I think you didn't even have a YouTube channel and yeah. now you're at what, like 120 something thousand subs. It's that's, that's pretty good, man. You're, you're putting in the work, you know, as I say, and you're, and you're, uh, enjoying the results of that. So congratulations on the, uh, hyper growth of the channel. Did they, did they much. send you your uh, plaque yet? No, you know, what's funny is we had the moment we were, I was so keen on getting that 100K, so keen on getting uh, getting that plaque. And then we, when we crossed the line, we had a community strike against us. <laughs> so, for like some thumbnail I put up. Well, you've... It, wasn't, it wasn't even that bad. The, look, the thumbnail was me, with, me with my head in some girl's like bosom, doing like this, like some comedic shit. Yeah. On my yeah, I found myself, if you use a thumbnail that, that exposes too much skin, then they'll strike it down. So you have to be you have to be careful with that. But yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, we're we're um yeah we're back to talking about business and entrepreneurship, and it's something people have uh, asked me to spend more time on. And for years they've been asking, you know, for the cheat codes to business and how do I start a business and how does that work? And you know, I'm I'm happy to talk about the um the why you want to be an entrepreneur and how it's beneficial and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of the details. A lot of the cheat codes to running a business really, um, I mean, you have to go through a lot of material and you have to spend some time at it and you have to have a whole bunch of sleepless nights and you're going to end up with some salt and pepper in your beard at some point from the stress of all of it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've managed to distill and sanitize it all into a course, which is currently open for enrollment called the School of Entrepreneurship. And um, it's uh, it's about four and a half hours of lectures uh, dealing with a whole bunch of different topics. We'll talk about that, you know, during the show and answer some questions. Uh, a private Facebook community, uh, Zoom calls, and I have a few bonuses with a bunch of guys from my uh, private business forum that are going to uh, contribute and chime in and share some of their experiences in business during the webinars. Excellent. You, 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 you definitely talked about I, just looking through like some of these these photos on this uh, on the page here, and it's like you've obviously been to like a billion different <laughs> webinar like like courses and events and work like yourself when trying to learn from guys who were like a few steps ahead of you during your pro your learning process like yeah i've always said it's it's easier to learn from the mistakes and the success of others than it is to make the mistakes themselves you know like yourselves right how how much do you get when you go to like say like a a, a big seminar from from some entrepreneur like how much are you getting out of that event versus like like how much is actual practical takeaway advice you were able to sort of implement versus you had like versus you know say fluff or filler or just like networking and then how many you know different events did you had to go to to sort of get all the different answers you actually wanted yeah i've, I've been to dozens now um i'll be honest with you the, like the more you spend going to events and the more expensive the event is, the higher the caliber of the people in a room. Like an example of a bad one that I went to was it was the first year that they launched it within the business community. There was a link and I liked the guy's business and I wanted to support him. So I bought a ticket for three grand and I flew down to Costa Rica and I did the thing. And I found out about half the participants there were given free access because they couldn't fill the room. So it's like, you know, part of the reason why you go to certain rooms is to surround yourself with better people. And then you realize that they didn't even have the ability to fill the room. So they're giving tickets to like these entrepreneurs that are like, you know, they have like a dog walking business or like a daycare that runs like six kids or something like that. Um, that's, 
you know, that's sort of like a mistake that you make. But, you know, generally speaking, some of the best experiences that I had, like one of my favorites, and I've done it three times now, was doing um, an off-road race in Mexico and uh, Baja. So you've probably, you know, heard of the Baja 1000 race where you go through the desert. Um, they rent these challenge cars out in the off season to people to have money to rent them. It's like 12 grand, you know, for the trip. And um, there's this outfit that my buddy Yannick Silver runs called Maverick Business Adventures. And he's got all these like high level marketers that are also car guys. And, you know, you're in the middle of a desert, fucking stars everywhere, nighttime with a bonfire. And it's like, you know, you're talking about some high level shit with people that are putting a massive dent in the universe. That's where the biggest aha moments come from. And I've done those dozens of times in different rooms. And, you know, like, you know, you figure out the good stuff from the bad stuff after a while. And a lot of that, you know, knowledge that I've gotten over the years, I've distilled and sanitized and put it in this course. I don't like long form, blah, blah, blah content. So I like to get it right down at the point. That's just my style. So that's why I've, uh, you know, got it down to that for you guys. Yeah, you want to what that's the whole point right is that you you're able to distill an entire like lifetime's worth of entrepreneurship down into like the core fundamentals that you can pass on to guys so they can yeah, save man. themselves all the time right 20 years 20 years it's been all and it's not even. it's not like you had um like i would consider my business to be an easy business because yeah. it's like it's it's a vehicle that require like it's internet money right it's a vehicle that doesn't require a whole lot of different overheads doesn't require a whole a whole lot of different people and you, you run a business that actually had employees that actually dealt with people which, which adds like another layer of like yeah. challenge when it comes to actually being successful as an entrepreneur like can you speak to that for a little bit like the, do you do you touch a little bit on in this course as i've gone through the curriculum i'm looking at it like do you touch a little bit on like choosing what kind of what business to make and then do you cover anything about like managing people in here as well? Hundred percent, dude. Um, so, can I throw the modules up on the screen? Can I share my screen, Absolutely. or do you want to do yours? Yeah. Oh, I can share my screen right here. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, if you want to throw the modules up, then we can kind of sort of oh, move cool. move through them one by one and explain oh, yeah. some of that. Because I mean, like one of the things that you were talking about there with your current business being, and I think that you use the words easy and fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, well, yeah. So there's an acronym. I don't know if you've heard it. It's 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 ELF, and the polar opposite of the ELF acronym is um, HALF, H A L F, and ELF stands for easy, lucrative, and fun. This is a term coined by Joe Polish. He used to do. I think he still does the I Love Mar Marketing podcast, but he used to talk often about this concept of if you're going to run a business, run an ELF business. It has to be easy, lucrative, and fun. Most entrepreneurs, I'm going to say like nine out of ten. When they create a business, they create a half business, hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And these are the guys that, you know, the vast majority of guys, and I talk about it on the landing page. I mean, if you look at the link that Sterling dropped there for you guys to buy the course, up at the very top, it talks about like the main problem where most people that start a business, nine out of 10 times, they start something that's not profitable, doesn't make them that much more money than what they were doing before as an employee exposes them to unnecessary risks with lawsuits. They deal with employee issues with people potentially suing them or not showing up to work. There's all kinds of things that tie into that. And it basically creates a lot of stress and a nightmare in their life. And what's the point of that? The entire point of a business is to build something that serves you. And you're not doing that if you're building a half business. So to your earlier point of, of like how you structure it right now w without employees and any of those things, like I've run a lot of companies and I've probably hired and fired well over 150 people, right? You know, throughout my years running businesses, whether I was an employee or running my own. And you're always going to run into extra problems employing people, right? There's certain circumstances and environments where you absolutely need to to perform certain tasks, but why not create a business where you don't need to? It's like, you know, when I talk about the red flags when you deal with women. I'm, I'm sure some of your audiences, you know, see my book or have heard about it because I know we talked about it before on your channel. But, you know, if you say something like, I don't know, um, she's constantly complaining, she's unhappy and unlucky. That's a red flag. Okay, that's red flag number three on my list, right? It's like, okay, that's kind of like inviting a, a crazy problem in your life that you get into a relationship with. It's going to drain you. It's like having employees is the same sort of thing. So why not structure a business that's going to serve you better and that you avoid all the problems that come with employees? Generally speaking, employees aren't very efficient, you know, to begin with. If you ask an employee if they're doing, 
enough, you know, for their paycheck, they always think that they are. And they basically work themselves up to this line in the sand where they think they should be working to. An employer, however, has a different line in the sand, which is much higher. And they want the employee to rise to that point because that's their minimum level of expectation. So there's a void there between what the employer expects of an employee and what the employee is actually providing. And yeah, you know, they get expensive. They, uh, they call in sick. They go on mat leave. They're banging each other. There's HR issues. There's all kinds of shit that happens, you know, with employees. They'll sue you if they don't like why they were dismissed and you didn't give them enough money. You know, they can create lawsuits for you, believe it or not. You know, they can do some pretty dumb shit, um, you know, in your business. So I talk about how to deal with HR in one of the modules. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It looks like module nine or so. It's about a 26 minute module. And I talk about, you know, how it is that you might want to deal with employees if you're going to have them under your care or if you want to avoid the problems with employees, how to structure a business in such a way where you're a company of one. Um, so free tip for you guys out there. There's a very good book called Company of One. I'd recommend reading it if that's something that's of interest to you. But I mean, if you want to cut right down to the meat and potatoes of, of everything, it's all in this course. It's all neatly outlined there, right? I remember a, a, a while ago, you, uh, I think it was on one of the first podcasts I watched of yours after we, after we done our, after you'd had me on your show, what, yeah, like a year and a half ago, you'd had a, you had a podcast on where you talked about the difference between like a side hustle and a business. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that they're like this, this side hustle is them being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Can you maybe touch on like what, like, I, I conceptually, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Mm. You know, it's, it's like the guy who dri di drives Uber on the weekends versus the guy who's actually like starting to build a business from scratch, right? Yeah. Why do you think people sort of want to label themselves as an entrepreneur without having to actually take? Because like, I think I think that's like a fun buzzword these days. People want, want to call themselves an entrepreneur. I mean, you sexy. see it all the time. It's sexy, yeah. You see it all the time with with uh, <laughs> women calling themselves entrepreneurs, or like they'll, you know, I'm a I'm a real estate agent. I do I do I don't know. I do uh, music on the weekends, and I'm also a fashionista, and I'm also an influencer. Like they'll they'll throw all these freaking sexy labels on top of themselves, yeah. but that actually like, but their their focus is not on like one thing in particular. Yeah. And I think that's to me, I think that's kind of what defines entrepreneur is that he's at least at the beginning is he's like pig-headed and, and obsessed with one particular venture. Yeah, it's going to be like for most guys, their their first startup is going to start out like a, a side hustle. The problem is, is that most people think way too small. So I would define a side hustle and a half business, one that is not really going to serve you over the long run, as something that's never going to break more than a million dollars a year in sales. Under a million dollars a year, which again, by the way, I mean, nine out of 10 businesses fail within the first few years. And of the ones that succeed, something like 97% of them never make more than a million dollars a year in sales. So if you can crack a million dollars a year in sales as an entrepreneur, you're in like the elite of the elite. And I know that that might sound like a lot of money, but it's really not that hard if you structure the business correctly. So a side hustle in my definition is somebody that's running a, you know, quote unquote, small business that doesn't generate more than, I think uh, you're going to need something like 88000 or $83,000 a year. I don't know what the exact math is right now. I don't have my calculator. <laughs> Surprisingly, not very good at math as an entrepreneur. You have to use a calculator if you're a guy like me. But yeah, the point being is like you need about $85,000 a month in sales receipts to crack a million dollars a year. And if you're under that, then you're really just running a side hustle. You're exposing yourself to unnecessary lawsuits because when you run a business, if somebody doesn't like something, um, even, even if you have a corporate shield and you've incorporated the business, a lot of lawsuits are designed and targeted to pierce the corporate shield. You're probably going to have, um, a whole bunch of expenses. So even if you're making a million dollars a year, you might be running six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in expenses, and you might be lucky to pay yourself two and a grand, right? Uh, that's really not big. That's not thinking big enough. Like there's a guy in the, um, chat right now, and he's talking about starting an automotive detailing business, uh, you know, cleaning. And I've, um, I've done that, you know, I did that when I was 16 in the summertime, I used to go back and forth, you know, between dealerships and I'd pick up the cars, bring them home, clean them, bring them back. That's not scalable because you're always exchanging time for money because 
you might invoice them $120 for an exterior detail and plus another 60 bucks for an interior detail. I don't know what the prices are today, but that's how it worked at the time. And you've only got like an hour, hour and a half to do that work. And then you're making $200 sort of thing off that. You're exchanging a block of time for a block of money. That's not scalable. So all you're doing is you're really exposing yourself to unnecessary risk running a business potentially getting sued, maybe dealing with employee issues that are going to be a freaking headache, tax liabilities. Um, if you're in Canada, you've got uh, health care to take care of all these payments that you've got to make to the government. And if they're not made on time, and you've also got regulations that could completely change the course of your business and flush it right down the toilet. Why are you thinking so small, right? Like you have to spend time at it. Why not spend time at structuring it in such a way that it's more profitable, more fun, and a lot easier than creating a nightmare. And that's basically what the course is designed to provide people is deal with the two main archetypes I feel that have talked to me over the years anyway is I have a problem, I hate my boss, I hate my job, I hate making him rich, I wanna start a business, I don't know where to start. This course answers that. If you're running a small business and it's not profitable, you're doing a few hundred, like under a million dollars a year, you know, let's say. Um, and it's not easy, it's not lucrative, it's not fun, you're getting headaches, you have employee issues, this course will help you pivot, right? So it deals with all the details of that. One of the things one of my early mentors taught me, this is back in my early 20s, and I was my first kind of exposure to anything entrepreneurial, right? And he taught me to think of businesses as just as like solving problems. He's like, if you can't yeah. think of like what business to start, think of like normally this is the wrong kind of uh, attitude to have in business and in entrepreneurship, but try to, uh, for at least a, pe a period of time, adopt the attitude of being like a whiny person mm -hmm. and think of like every single problem you can come up with. Like what, what pisses you off about every little thing throughout the, throughout the day. That's or, usually the uh, itch that most guys will scratch. But I mean, like there's a caveat to that too, right? I mean, you might be like, I get pissed off with, I don't know, like, let's say we get pissed off at woke culture. Okay. Well, Elon must solve that problem for himself by buying Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that was a wise financial decision. You know, last time I checked, Twitter makes like $4 billion a year. He paid $44 billion for it. I don't know if he's ever going to get an ROI on that, but... He was just pissed off with, you know, like woke and censorship and all that sort of stuff. So um, it's not always wise to pursue something that pisses you off, although um, that's usually where most guys start from. Right. So so there's that to consider. And again, I talk about that in some of the modules of my courses, um, course modules as well. But like the other thing to understand, too, is that um, you have to take something that you're world class at. Like, you know, you, for example, were, were, was a male, uh, you know, adult film star, you know, the industry. You know, uh, I mean, you've obviously had a lot of experience with women. So then you thought to yourself, all right, well, there's this thing called YouTube that people search for information on. I'm going to put out information that will solve those problems. I'm going to offer them more information to get on my email list. Uh, some of it's going to be free. Some of it's going to be behind a paywall and it's well organized. And you came to realize, of course, that people are willing to give you their hard earned money if you can collect information, aggregate it, organize it, and then sell it to them in a nice, clean format. And that's what courses are. You know, basically, it's an information product. So, you know, because you're world class at that, you figured out a way, and you like it, obviously, you know, you figured out a, a way to leverage that and make it part of your lifestyle. And it's working for you now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it was this like, it's this nice overlap, like in a, like a Venn diagram. Between, yeah, like, yeah. So what, what you're good at, what people are willing to pay for. Yeah, like these are all things that you absolutely have to consider, right? Um, you know, far, far too many guys have approached me over the years, whether they were going to lean into a business that they, um, didn't know anything about just because they saw an ad on their social media timeline of some young guy standing in front of a Lambo. He probably rented saying, I'll teach you how to be an FBA, you know, Amazon champ. If you follow my three simple steps or whatever it is. Right. And then they end up getting into a business that they absolutely hate, or they don't even realize that. Amazon's algorithms are actually designed to destroy you, right? Like you can't compete against Amazon. If you have a very profitable, uh, high selling product, they're going to push you down and put out their own product. That's going to suppress it. That's going to like, that's how they make money, right? So they're basically using you to test out, you know, products on their platform. And a lot of people don't realize that. And it's like all of these mistakes that have been made over the years, along through time, 
I'm, I'm very observant, right? Like I pay attention, like I'm good at shit. Like I'm good at solving problems and figuring out stuff. So I've collected it, I've aggregated it, and I've put it all in the course so everybody can go through it and not make the mistakes that others have made and at least get, you know, like a leg up if they're gonna go and do something. There's one there's one uh, module in your course here, which I'm, I'm just gonna put this back on the screen, screen again, which is, which is an interesting title here. Why borrowing money is generally dumb. Yeah. <clears throat> can you uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit, Rich? Because I think that's quite interesting. Because most, <clears throat> I, I've been having this conversation once with with uh, a good friend, Justin Waller, mm -hmm. and we were talking about like if the first, I, I immediately know you're going to be terrible at business, and your your, your business is going to completely fail. If the first thing you go out and spend money on is merch, yeah, you know how many. Like, about like branding t-shirts and getting pens and a cup and mugs and no that you're focusing on completely the wrong thing yeah there, there's a lot of guys that have messaged me over the years to invest in their business and the first thing i ask is how much are you making and always it's no money but they want my money for their idea and they have no proven you know track record of success they've never had an exit it's an absolute no from that point like you're running around trying to borrow money to build a business it's like you want to build your business and I'm taking the risk while you fuck around with my money. I don't think so, right? And that's the way that almost everybody looks at it when they're dealing with these people that are trying to raise capital with exceptions. Like if you've had several successful exits, you know, raising capital, dealing with angel investors, you've built massive audiences. Um, a very good example is um, the, the Clarity platform, which is a platform that I use for coaching. The guy that founded that uh, platform, his name's Dan. And um, he's had three prior exits to that. Then there was a Clarity exit. Now he's out there selling software as a service courses, right? Which he is world class at, right? So that's somebody that you'd want to listen to. That's somebody that you'd want to invest in, you know, in the ne next project. But for the most part, it's it's generally dumb. And you can bootstrap most businesses. Like you know, to like to you with your business, did you ever have to borrow money, or did you bootstrap yeah. the whole thing and make make profit from pretty much month one? Like the first, probably, the first expense I probably had was this was this camera, right? And like I just I that was probably like a, what a week's a week's worth of earnings set it aside, bought the camera, bought the tripod, yeah, bang, yeah. Like it's great. So, yeah. So that's my point. Is I mean, for the most part, if you structure a business in the right niche in the right area, you don't need to raise capital. You can actually make money very quickly if you structure it as an easy, lucrative, fun business. Again, most people will complicate their lives unnecessarily. They do it in every area with friends, with women, with business, with money, with investing. Complicate life, justify why. I've been saying this for years. And it's the same thing with business, right? Like most people fail at business because they've because they've come at something from the wrong angle. And it's not their fault. It's like society doesn't teach you how to run a business. They don't want to teach you how to be independent. They want you as a cog in the wheel. They want you to be sheep. They want you to show up, punch your clock, you know, earn your money, go home and rinse and repeat for the rest of your life sort of thing. And that was enough, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, right? You know, and my parents and grandparents, you know, came back from the war sort of thing. But that's not enough today if you want to achieve, you know, like, the, the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy, right? Which is a self-actualization. You're you're legitimately going to have to get into running something for yourself. I remember noticing this trend in when I was back in Australia because I I had I had a couple of small businesses before I moved to America. Um, one one not so successful, one one and then one moderately successful, which I ended up selling. And it was I always found it interesting whenever I like. When I went to a bank, just just to open up a, like a bank account, mm -hmm. for a bit. maybe Canada might be similar to this, being from the Commonwealth as well. When it came to like talking about like credit cards and opening lines of credit and things like that, they always wanted to know like they they had this ar kind of old, super old school, archaic like way of thinking about business. It's like, what is your business plan? What is your <laughs> like having all these fucking like documents and stuff? Yeah. It's like. It's, it's the kind of stuff that someone would teach you in a in a university course yeah. on business. Some yeah. dude who's never actually made fucking money in the real world is sitting there teaching you all like this bullshit theory and like, oh, you need to have you have a well thought out business plan, motherfucker. Like a business changes <laughs> from day to day. Like <laughs> if it's not if you're not you need to be able to I adapt like on the fly and 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 evolve on the fly and pivot and stuff. Yeah. So. so like, 
That's another point to the whole, like, you don't need money to start a business and borrowing it is generally dumb is the gatekeeper that's going to give you access to financial resources at a, at a, a bank, let's say, is some nerd that has never run a business in his entire life that's asking you to qualify to get some of the institution's money, right? Like you have to, you have to convince some geek that knows nothing about running a business that you're running a good business model. It's like, why would you even want to deal with that? Like bypass that completely and go, you know, directly to building a model where you don't need to borrow money. One of the other things that you said earlier on, which I completely, you know, forgot to expand on is you were talking about solving problems, right? But I mean, you were talking about solving problems from the angle of, you know, if you can solve a problem, then you can charge for it and you can build a business sort of thing. But the other part of that too is, one of the things you have to be good at as an entrepreneur is being a problem solver. In fact, I would I would say it is probably the most important skill that you have to develop is you have to be able to solve problems, right? As a guy, you know, generally speaking, you have to be able to solve your reproductive problems. You know, you have to learn how to interact with women and be able to engage with them and get what you want out of them. It's the same thing with building a business, right? You have to be a good problem solver. You have to know what kind of business to run, how to run it profitably, what strategies to take, what to do and what not to do. And again, that's why I put everything there for you guys in this course. The other, the other way I, I was taught to think about money um, from one of my early on, on, like my early early mentors was he told me to think of like money as condensed time, and that kind of store of value. Into, like, yeah, yeah, it's a store of value. It leans into yeah. that idea of like solve it. If you can solve a problem for somebody else, then it's worth money because yeah. like the basic example I always like to use is okay if if my sink is blocked, right. I'm going to pay a plumber to come and fix that problem for me because it's going to, because I'm, I'm paying him not only for the time it takes to do that and that yeah. late, that energy and the labor it takes to do that, but I'm paying him for this, the time it took to learn the skills to do that properly. Mm -hmm. Like that time investment in that particular skill set is what I'm paying for. So that's why that, that idea of like that time is actually can, is, is literally turned into cash Yeah, when you, you invest in the right skill set. Let me, um, let me tell you a funny story about a locksmith. So yeah, so money is stored value, right? Um, that's all it is. It's a store of value. So anybody that's accumulated a lot of money has created a lot of value for the world. You know, you can go back to the Elon Musk, right? He's building rockets, electric cars, solar panels, bought Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Like he's created some value and he's made some money and it's, and, and it's stored in cash and whatever he decides to put it in. <clears throat> so, I mean, like the thing with business itself is, when it comes to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when it comes to um, creating value um, is probably the best way to define it is you want to be able to give people five to 10 times more value than what they're paying for. Like one of the common complaints, there's always going to be somebody you'll probably see in your comments afterwards is like, why should I pay for the cards when I can do is quick Google search or it's available in a book. It's not. I promise you that you're not going to find it in five minutes with a quick Google search or it's in one book. It's a collection of experiences, books, conversations, masterminds, events I've attended, all this stuff distilled down to the main point. So again, it's worth five to 10 times what it is that you're going to pay for it with all the bonuses and stuff as well. So, I mean, like when you're building a business, you have to, like, you have to create value for them. Like one of the problems that you solve is you solve a lot of men's, you know, sexual frustrations, obviously. And they're not going to get that answer for, you know, listening to some radio show. I remember when I was a kid, like here in Toronto, there was a radio show. It was, it was called uh, su the uh, uh, Sunday Night sex, so sex Show with Sue. And I remember like one time when there was a newspaper article, because we didn't have the internet back then. That's how young I was. There was an article with her in it. And she was like an 80-year-old woman. I was like, oh, dude, I've been listening to this lady lecture me on sex. It's like, you know. <laughs> she and probably then, had a good voice, though. Had it, it, yeah. Story. Yeah. Like it fooled you. Like you didn't know her age, but I mean like, you know, today we've got guys like Sterling Cooper who are, you know, performance stars obviously, and they have some experience and they can connect with you directly, which is one of the beautiful things about today's marketplace is it's never been easier to be an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Like 20, 30, 40 years ago, th there were gatekeepers, you know, like, um, there was no internet, <laughs> there was no YouTube, there was no, you know, easy ways to build an audience and market to them with a blog or a, or a YouTube channel or anything like that. And today it's completely permissionless, but people still make excuses. You know, 
I hear a lot of guys whine. They're like, oh, Rich, you know, you're completely out of touch. You say that a guy should be a millionaire by the time he's 30 uh, or 40, you know, ideally 30. That's impossible. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Be poor. I don't care. Right. You know, <laughs> how's that working out for you? There are things that you can do that are proven to get you closer to success. Right. And it's like, you know, how bad do you want it? I mean, do you want to make ex like you can have excuses or you can have results. You can't have both. Absolutely, man. It's and, and that's maybe that's uh, maybe that's a, a, a result of the very thing that makes it easier. Maybe that's a result of like social media and the internet. Everyone's everyone's seeing everyone else. You know, it's easy to it's easy to get on the internet and look at other people's success and think that it just came overnight and mm -hmm. think that it was just this because all you see is especially with social media businesses especially with you know, YouTube businesses, Instagram businesses, whatever, all you see is the end result. You don't really see, you never really see the process. And, and, and look, with no, with any business, you don't really see the process behind the scenes. Yeah. But how, how with your, with your, um, you know, with your debt consolidation business, like when did you kind of know that you were onto something really good? Like, was there ever, ever just like an epiphany moment? You're like, yeah, this is what, like, I can see that this has legs and I'm going to keep, I'm going to double down. There was a lot. I mean, you know, and again, I talk about all the details in the course too, but I mean, to sort of touch on a few that come to memory, um, there was getting awards for hyper growth, growth. Uh, there was getting nominated for entrepreneur of the year in Canada by Ernest and young. There was people reaching out to me, uh, like, here, I have this here still from last week or from my last show, but we like the company got on the front page of the Toronto Stars business section. This is me here down over here with hair looking like a dork in front of the company logo, but front page of the largest publication in Toronto. When this was published, I had everybody and their mother that told me that it was never going to work and that I was being stupid and I should just get a job somewhere else, somewhere, call me up, email me and ask me for a job. And you know, like all of a sudden now they're my friend, right? So it's like, there was a lot of aha moments, but I think the biggest one was when you're running the business and at the end of the month, there's way more money than month, right? You're like, you know, you have to call your account and you're like, um, I've got 80 grand in cash, like left over after I paid expenses. What am I supposed to do with this, right? It's like, that's a good problem to have. Mm. Huh. So, yeah, for you, so for you, it was basically like a numbers thing. You were just like, okay, like this, there's all, I like that you thought of it that way. There's all this cash like left over, and you, the first thing you thought of to do was talk to your accountant. That's yeah. not the first thing I would have done, but maybe that makes you a better entrepreneur than me. <laughs> well, a good accountant, and there's a module on dealing with accountants, dealing with legal, dealing with insurance, dealing with government and regulation, because these are all important things to contemplate as you grow, right? But when it comes to professionals, an accountant's supposed to find ways to help you spend money in such a way that limits your tax liabilities and minimize risks, right? Um, most accountants are, are just like color within the lines, like cross your T's, dot your I's, everything has to be perfect. And I knew I found a good accountant when I went from the guy that yelled at me because when I gave him my books for the first year, he's like, what the fuck were you thinking? Like, why are you doing things like this? I'm like, what am I paying you for? You're the fucking accountant. Like, just fix it and make it look right. And then I switched over to another guy who happened to be his old, old partner, by the way, who basically, you know, came at me with like, all right, I think I found some ways to make you some more money and lower your tax burden. I'm like, that's the guy that I want in my corner working with me. And, you know, like one of the big mistakes that guys make is like, I'm going to go to business school and I'm going to take accounting courses and marketing courses and legal courses. And you don't need any of that. All you need, like if you need somebody to deal with your books, you hire an accountant. If you have a legal issue, you hire a fucking lawyer, right? You don't need to know how to respond to legal notices, for example, which by the way, four to five times are bullshit. You don't even have to respond to them. You can just run them through a shredder because there's no claim attached to it. Hmm. Do you, do you talk, cause I, obviously your business was based in Canada. I know you have a, you have a module in, in this course about like legalities and, and government regulations and things yeah. like that. Do you kind of touch a little bit on, on the American system as well as the Canadian system? Yeah. Well, I talk about it from an overview, right? Like I'm not going to talk about the micro stuff. I talk about it from like altitude, maybe a 20,000 feet kind of looking down at the landscape and it's like, okay, well, when legal matters happen, this is what you need to contemplate. When you have government regulation coming your way, this is why they're doing it. And this is what you need to contemplate because they all operate the same way. Like the purpose of government is to get bigger, fatter, take more of your money, you know, without your permission. Like it's the same around the world. It's not that much different aside from what the intricacies are 
of the details, at which point you're going to hire. Uh, I mean, if you're dealing with a legal issue, you're going to hire a, a lawyer that's licensed in your state or province or territory to help you with that matter sort of thing. But under a million dollars in sales, which is really what this course is for, is, is people that aren't running a business or that are running a business that's not profitable doing less than less than a million dollars a year that's driving them nuts. This is this is the framework so that as you grow and as you're building it, these are the early step strategies that you're going to take. By the time you've gotten past a million dollars a year in sales, this course isn't going to be useful for you. You're going to, you know, if a legal matter shows up, you're going to rely on a lawyer because you've got the time and resources to deal with that. But it does set your mindset straight. I mean, I'm not saying there's no value if you're doing over a million dollars a year in sales. It'll it'll get your head screwed on right so that you understand how to have the best experience running your business, dealing with certain issues. Because again, back to the point of running a business, I mean, the whole point of it is to to throw off profit for its shareholders. That's what the point of a business is. Most people run hobbies where they're like, well, I like dogs, so I'm going to start a dog walking business. Well, cool. What are you making? Like eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a month? whoop do you do right? Like that's not scalable and you're always exchanging time for money. So it's like, you know, you have to be a good problem solver. How do you make it scalable? How do you grow it? You know, it, it, is there a pivot required? Like that's one of the big things that a lot of people completely miss is almost mm -hmm. all businesses that you see today out there have pivoted at some time into something else. Netflix used to send uh, DVDs out in the mail and then they created a streaming service. Instagram used to be a check-in service where people would go on their phone and kind of check in like Foursquare, I think it was called, something like that. And then they realized that people were using, you know, the photography and the and, and filtration stuff like that way more and they turned it into a social media app and it blew up, right? I mean, they sold it to Facebook for what, a billion dollars like a few years after they actually started it? Like, you know, all of these pivots happen, you know, e even Apple, you know, pivoted from making computers to really most of the revenue came from the MP3 player, which, you know, turned into the iPod and iPhones, right? Mm -hmm. So pivoting um, is a big part of a business, that, you know, if you want to grow it and stay relevant, otherwise you're going to go out of business. Sam, I think, I think if I remember this correctly, uh, Samsung used to sell rice. <laughs> way, yeah. way, way back in the day, like three, because Samsung is like three star. Lamborghini used to sell tractors, right? Like the story behind Lamborghini is awesome. Like he, he basically stole tractors that were left over after the war, put his badge on it, re-engineered them, sold more, made some money. And he's like, I like fast cars. So he went over to Enzo at Ferrari and said, I want to buy a Ferrari, but I think your clutch sucks. And I don't like this part of the car. Will you change it? Enzo told him to go fuck himself like this. And he said, you know what? I'm going to make my own supercar. And then that's what created, you know, Lamborghini as a supercar company. They, they completely pivoted. They still make tractors, by the way. Um, okay. If you haven't seen Jeremy Clarkson on, on his um, Amazon you know, special, he bought a Lamborghini tractor just because you know, of the kind of guy that he is. But Lamborghini today is known as a supercar company. And like you, you, th you look at that and you look at like the the monumental sort of scale of where say like as an example where something like Lamborghini is now right, but that story right there shows you the like the very very beginning part. It, this is why I love hearing these kind of stories of businesses when they when they were brand spanking new because mm -hmm. it's like okay well he took some he took a tractor and he redid it and he sold it. It's something it's something that one guy can do with his time, right? There was a there was a starting point for a minimum viable product there was a, and that all it didn't take like someone coming to rich cooper and saying hey can you can you invest all this money in my business it just took him solving a problem putting his putting his time focus and energy into something and turn it making that first dollar yeah like that the first dollar is the most important one like how quickly can you go from idea to money in your pocket well i can tell you you know the first dollar the first check that I got from a paying customer in my debt business, which was like the big pivotal, you know, moment for me was, it was about two weeks after I, like I incorporated the business February 8th, 2003. And I think by the end of that month, um, a few weeks later, I got my first payment from a customer. I'm not going to mention his name, but I still remember his name, um, for $320 and 28 cents, made a photocopy of it, put it up on the, the wall. And it's like, Every check that came in after that for like the first like, you know, few weeks, I would I would put them around my whiteboard and I'd make a photocopy. It's like after about a month, I had so many fucking checks. I'm like, OK, this is a waste of my time. I don't need to do this anymore. I know that I have a working business model. But yeah, I mean, you should be able to 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 
get people to pay you relatively quickly if you structure it properly. I mean, like even in that business, like that's a service-based business, right? Um, you've got service-based business, you've got information-based businesses, you've got physical products, like those tend to be the main one. There's also business to business and a few other intercrees out, out there. But for the most part, most guys that are going to start a business will think of, most guys will think about a physical product, which by the way, sucks. Mm -hmm. Like I have, I have a supplement line, which is all physical products. Now the white label, you know, supplement line is done by the best company in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. They've already got FDA approval on all the ingredients. They don't ship to any countries where um, the nation won't accept shipment because of the ingredients that are included in it. So they've done all the work, but still items get returned. These are all in glass bottles. Glass bottles break. You know, There's problems that come with physical products that you can completely avoid if you structure your business in such a way that it's an information business, it's an audience building business. Uh, you know, it's a service-based business. You can pivot and add other things to the model. Like it made sense to me, right? Like I have the Unplugged Alpha book. Okay, cool. Now I have the Unplugged Alpha supplement. Mine. I have the Unplugged Alpha podcast. It's an entire ecosystem that sort of builds off each itself. And it made sense for me to add that. And it makes, you know, the business money sort of thing. But generally speaking, I've seen guys, you know, show up. I had this one guy that, um, you know, booked me for a coaching call once and he had a physical product where he was shipping um, trinkets for men rings, bracelets, necklaces, earrings, like like men's jewelry. And about 15, 20 minutes into the call, it was pretty clear that he hated the business. He hated shipping it. He hated, hated dealing with Amazon, you know, getting it on the shelves, dealing with the returns, the payment processing, getting banned on payment processing, having to move to another one. And he's like, why don't, why don't you just buy the business and run it and make some money off? And I'm like, why would I want to buy something that you hate? <laughs> right. And, you know, like that's the thing. Most guys don't think about these things when they structure the business and they go and build something that doesn't serve them that they actually end up hating at some point, which is fine. If it has value, then you can get out of it. Like I didn't like my debt business after about 15 years. I didn't like the regulators, didn't like the government, didn't like all the problems that were coming with uh, credit issuers. And I'm like, you know what? I'll, you know, my brother was interested and he's like, you know, let's do an earn out buy it. We, you know, we structured it properly. I still sit on the board to, you know, advise on the business, but it's like, you know, I wanted to move on, right? And it's okay to pivot and move on, you know, if you have the opportunity to do it. It's just, if you're selling trinkets and, and jewelry to men, how do you sell that business, right? Like, what's the value in it? There's no value. If you have customers, if you have a blog list, if you're an insurance agent and you have a book of business that you sell insurance to, you know, for example, that has some value, right? If you have an audience, that has some value. I, I call that like building a prison of your own design. Yeah. Right, you, you, you've built, weaseled your own way into like this shitty situation and you've got no one to blame it blame but yourself and then you then because i've seen guys i've seen a lot of guys do this and they sit they sit there like oh man i fucking I, mean, I hate this thing but i've got nothing else i can't i can't give it up now got i've got this, nothing like, else to do and i've invested so much in it that i have to keep doing it that's it it's the it's the, it's the sunk cost fallacy of the whole it's like thing. the it's shitty like, marriage oh. right you know like the woman abuses you doesn't have sex with you you know, treats your kids like shit, you know, embarrasses you in front of family and friends, but they stick around because they don't want to lose half their shit and they had, they don't have better options. That's it. That's it. So this, you could say this course is about giving guys better options when it comes to business and entrepreneurship. Oh, dude, a hundred percent, man. It's, it's all about getting right to the meat and potatoes. Like I cut right through all the bullshit and I get to all the good stuff that I've learned over the years. And it's just like, you know, Look, if you guys are interested, I know Sterling's got to run and it, you know, he's got a busy night, but if you guys are interested, the course is open. It closes on Saturday this week. Um, you want to get it now. I mean, if it, if it's something that you've wanted to do, it's available now. Again, the bonuses are you're going to get a uh, private Facebook group. There's some Zoom calls and you're going to get some bonus presentations from guys, you know, within my business community. They're going to talk to you about their individual business. I, I have a home builder in Australia. I got a hustler in Romania, not the ones that you guys think it is. It's a different guy. Um, I got a book publisher that's put out over 250 titles uh, from Sweden. He's a very young guy, very successful. I've got a home flipper in the US. I got a guy that runs a whole bunch of critical care centers in the US as a doctor slash entrepreneur. There's lots of stuff that's going to come out of it. So, I mean, you know, if you want the uh, cheat codes to running a business, there you go. So it comes, so just to clarify for everybody, so you get you get all these course material modules and then on but it's exclusive, all the uh, um, all these webinars, all this Telegram group stuff. You can only get access to all this if you sign up before Saturday night. Correct. Yeah. Right. After Saturday, the course closes. I'll open it again at some point in the future, maybe with some changes, but it's open right now. And the price might go up next time, you know, depending on what I put in it. It's, it's currently offered at uh, 997 
There we go. That's US, not Canadian. USD. <laughs> it's one of the key well, points of one of the modules. You got to bill in, in world reserve currency, right? Like, why would I bill in Canadian dollars when I can bill in USD? Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. See, that's why. Look. I could have I could have been billing in Australian dollars this whole time, which would have been a, a retarded thing to do. Right. Precisely. Anyway, <laughs> I do I, I do uh, I do have to run, uh, Rich. But it's been ha fantastic having you on as always. The link is in the chat and in the description down below for everybody who is interested in joining the School of Entrepreneurs. Please go check it out. Support me. Support Rich. And uh, look, as always, it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. So. Thanks, brother. Appreciate seeing you. Good seeing you guys, too. Yeah.